With all my heart, I will praise you, O Lord my God. I will give glory to your name forever, for your love for me is very great. You have rescued me from the depths of death. Hi, I'm Cheryl, Cheryl Boyd, and uh, I want to introduce our speakers for us today. Um, they are women that feel that gratitude, that, that song it expresses, and, uh, and they're going to help us think through this theme of rescuing from shame and fear. So the first speaker is going to be Madison Hungerford, and Madison actually has been the person that helped put this vision together. Uh, and she's going to be sharing from the idea of rescue from perfectionism. She grew up in Oregon and is the women's ministry leader now for our sister church in Bend, which just formed this week. So there's a lot going on in her life. She pulled this all off with uh, the love of uh, the sisters, and, um, and she's there in Bend now. So she's also serving as a certified grief counselor. Shanna Thorne will share next for us, and she is going to share about being rescued from abuse and infidelity. And Shanna has led discussions for different women about purity and continues to be uh, useful in helping uh, as a couple with uh, her husband uh, helping to help other couples understand uh, what, uh, what they can do to overcome this issue in their lives. And then Roxanne Reitman will share about being rescued from the bondage of mental illness. And she has led discussions about mental illness and spirituality for many years. And she continues to help women in the community that are struggling with mental health issues and she serves as a certified grief counselor. So uh, I'm very excited to have these women present for us today. Hello. Uh, like Cheryl said, my name is Madison Hungerford, and I'm going to be sharing about my journey with um, perfectionism and um, I'm just say inadequacy when it comes to perfectionism. Um, I am somebody, I think a lot of us are, but I feel very familiar with shame, I'm very familiar with insecurity, and so I just kind of want to share my journey with you guys of what I've learned, um, what God has really taught me through um, just kind of coming to his understanding about those things. So, um, as you can tell, I'm very tall. I'm five foot ten. And because of that, um, I've always felt very out of place in life. I've been 5 of 10 since eighth grade. So I've always felt very just awkward and like I don't fit in. Um, I've really, all throughout high school, found a lot of my identity in being someone's girlfriend. Um, I've been staying in a relationship for three years with somebody that, um, out of fear that I would never really find someone else. Um, and so I stayed. Um, I grew up with four beautiful girlfriends. Um, two of them are here, Kelsey and Alex. <laughs> They're beautiful. Um, and that was such a joy with so many memories. But um, I always had this feeling of feeling less than um, in my own insecurity, always feeling like less beautiful, less thin, funny, interesting, unique. Like I always compared myself and just felt inadequate. Um, I really believed that my height, and I have a very quiet personality naturally, like we're what, we, we're what made me weird um, and unable to fit in in high school. Um, this was before we knew what things like introverts were. They didn't have that term when I was in high school. It was just like fun people and not fun people is what I thought. So, so I was like, yeah, I'm the not fun one. <laughs> um, so this is before all that, and uh, it really kept me back from being able to experience true belonging with friendships. Um, I really tried to hide these imperfections that I saw in myself. Um, I slouched constantly, and I still have to keep my posture better. 
Um, I starved myself for a long time. I overexercise. Uh, like I said, I stayed in honestly kind of not great relationships just because they made me feel worthy and loved and chosen. Um, for years, I really, really struggled to connect in relationships. I just felt distant and I felt like I didn't belong. Um, I had a really deep fear of vulnerability as well because of all these insecurities that I felt if, I, if people really saw me for who I was, there's no way I would fit in because I already don't and for who I am, who I'm trying to pretend to be. Um, so I was really afraid to just be myself. Um, on top of all of that, I grew up in the heart of the information age. So social media has been a huge part of my life since middle school. Um, you know, suddenly people just know you, know you, you know, based on the carefully portrayed image that you create online. Um, and I think that our generation is just now like getting sick of it. I think we're finally at a place that we really value people who are authentic. Um, in business, on social media, anything, we start really caring about people who are real. Like, this is how awful my day was, let's be real. Like, we're drawn to that. Um, I think we're just sick of the perfectionist culture that we grew up in as kids. Um, I think we just love to see people being courageous for who they are. Um, so, I really had to work at vulnerability every single day. This is not my strength. Many of you know this is not my strength. Um, but I just want to share with you guys what I've learned this year through that, through realizing this is my weakness. Um, something I've learned is that perfectionism is a lie from Satan. Um, that perfectionism, what leads to perfectionism, is shame. It's, I'm not good enough. I've done something wrong or I've not done something enough, um, therefore I'm not going to be accepted. Um, I think shame really leads us to try to be a perfectionist and create this facade. Um, but something I realize is that God doesn't love me because of what I do, but because of who he is. And he's our father. Um, so I want to share a little bit about the first woman who experienced shame ever and uh, the temptation to be perfect. And that woman is Eve. Um, so if you have a Bible, go ahead and turn over to Genesis 3. Um, but if not, I'm just going to read it to you guys. So for those of you who don't know, Genesis 3 is the beginning of the Bible. Um, the world was just created. There's the animals and the sky and the oceans and everything. And God created this world with no shame. The humans felt no shame whatsoever. Um, he created Adam, and from Adam he made Eve. And it says in their relationship that they were naked and felt no shame. And honestly, that concept of world without shame is really hard to imagine in our day to day in relationships where there's nothing in between you and another person at all. But I love that that's God's heart. So in Genesis chapter 3, um, I'm going to read verses 1 through 13. It says, Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God actually say you shall not eat of the tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden. Neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took its fruit and ate and she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together to make, and made themselves loincloths. And they heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard you. I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. He said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, The woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me the fruit of the tree, and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this you have done? And the woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. So when I say that I think perfectionism is a lie from Satan, this is what I mean, that Eve believed this lie from Satan that she could be like God. 
Um, and I think we all kind of think that when we want to be perfect, is I want to be independent of God and of people. I don't want to need people. Um, and this was really her temptation from Satan was to be independent of God, independent of her husband. Um, and it says, you know, Eve believed this lie and she was deceived. It was not the truth. So we see sin enter the world here for the first time, and the consequence of this is shame. So when I say shame, <clears throat> I'm going to define it for us, because that can mean a lot of different things. Um, the way that I've heard it best defined is the intensely painful belief that we are imperfect and therefore unworthy of love and belonging. That something we've experienced, done, or failed to do makes us unworthy of connection. And something to understand here is that shame and guilt are different. Um, guilt is I did something bad, but shame is that I am bad. And so we see sin enter the world here, and the immediate feeling is guilt, right? Like we did something wrong, but then instead we, ha we get to choose. Like am I going to confess and share what, what's going on in my life, or will I hide it to myself? I think shame makes us hide. Um, like I said, I think when we feel shame, the way that we react is, the first of all, we hide, and then second of all, we self-protect. And we see this in the scripture here, because rather than sharing with God, hey, I made a mistake, this says that they hid. This says that they made these fig leaves for themselves, which are like these big, broad leaves that are very thin and prickly. Um, and the word for them in Greek is like an armor. So it says when they, when they messed up, they made like an armor for themselves to cover their vulnerable spots. Um, but these, these coverings are flimsy, aren't they? And I think that we all do this. I think that we all make coverings for ourselves when we feel vulnerable. I think for me, one is Netflix. <laughs> like we, just, we joke about that a lot, that like, you know, binging on Friends or Gilmore Girls, things like that, some way to just check out. Um, social media, spending hours scrolling on Facebook or Instagram, self-medicating, whether that's alcohol, drugs, food, shopping, anything. Um, for me personally, I stuff my feelings and I stuff my face. <laughs> I, <laughs> I numb out and I overeat because those are like I put on Netflix and I get a nice bowl of something crunchy and I just go to town and that's my way to like zone out in my own little world. Um, but really we can only be free from shame that we all feel shame. Like we all feel shame. But we can only be free when we give words to it when we share it, when we cultivate openness in our relationships with people and with God. Um, so how does God respond in this scripture? You know, I just see so much love and so much gentleness from God. All I see is he asks them questions. He doesn't force them to like be honest with them. He just says, you know, what is it that you've done? Have you done this? Have you done this? Like he really gives them a chance to be open and they, they're not honest, you know, they, they blame shift, we're not going to talk about Adam today, they blame shift, but, but, you know, and they, you know, say, well, I was deceived, and things like that, they don't really step up and just say, you're right, God, I messed up, this is what I did, and I want to be connected to you again, they let shame hide them and protect themselves. Um, in verse 21, in chapter 3, it says, and this isn't, this is something I just noticed this year, is it says, and the Lord God made for Adam and his wife garments of skin and clothed them. So he explains to them the consequence of this sin. There's consequences. And then he, um, as he basically has to escort them out of this beautiful garden of Eden where there is no shame, he, let, he takes off their prickly, flimsy coverings and he gives them what's defined as like a robe-like animal skin that's soft and warm for them. So I love that even on our way, even on our journey away from God, sometimes He's always like alluring us back to Himself in small ways and big. Um, I say that God understands shame, and He really wants to be the healing that comes from it. Our imperfections, to me, are really actually a gift from God because they allow us to have compassion on one another and to experience connection between each other. Um, like Cheryl said, I. I moved this week to Bend. It's honestly been a really crazy couple of weeks. Uh, we were planning this, and I'm, I drove to, from Bend this morning. We left at like 5, so it's been kind of a crazy day. But I can't tell you how much this experience has exposed a lot of my inadequacies, and I'm really grateful 
because I feel like God has taught me so much this year that it's not about being perfect, it's about just being mature and learning to be open and vulnerable with the women in my life and with my husband and with God. Um, he's really been teaching me not to let fear and shame control my mind and control my actions. Um, he's been helping me to really lean into vulnerability by cultivating openness in relationships, not, being, not letting shame keep me from being real. Um, and to just, at the end of the day, to not believe the lie of perfectionism that I think is just rampant in our culture today. Just, just be real. Just be real. I think that's exactly what God asks of us. So that's my story. I'm doing a song for you called um, Rest in You. Um, I'm going to read the scripture that was shared with me this morning and helped me so much. It says, But as for me, I will look to the Lord. I will wait for the God of my salvation. My God will hear me. Rejoice not over me, O my enemy. When I fall, I shall rise. When I sit in darkness, the Lord will be a light to me. So that's Micah 7, 7 through 8. Um, so here's our song. <laughs>
something that sounded palatable, but uh, it's my own stuff. It's the stigma of mental illness, um, but it is what it is. Uh, what I'm going to share is first just how um, God has used this to really help me become the woman that I am and to be molded and shaped and learn about who God is. I never thought I would say that I'm grateful for these things in my life, and I will share a little bit about that later, but I really am because it has helped me to become compassionate, to be humble, to not be so self-reliant, to really need desperately God, and that is not the kind of person I am by nature. Um, the purpose in sharing this also is just to show that God is an amazingly loving God who rescues us from the past, the present, and will continue to rescue us in our life. I definitely see that in my life. Um. You know, there are times he's rescued me when I didn't even know he rescued me, when I, I didn't even ask for it. And uh, I realize that he will do whatever it takes to bring us to a relationship with him. And sometimes those things are not very fun, and they're, not, they're very painful. Um, he also showed me that there's a purpose in pain, um, if we allow it, and that God can be a God of triumph over tragedy. Um, I'm going to share just some of the diagnoses that I've had uh, over the past years. Um, I've been diagnosed with bipolar, PTSD, borderline personality disorder, I've had a severe eating disorder, OCD, ADD, self-harming and cutting, and recovering alcoholic. I'm a mess. Um, <laughs> in the last 25 years, I've had uh, over 30 psychiatric hospitalizations, um, four major suicide attempts, three of which left me in a coma. Um, 
I have approximately 55 to 60 stitches on my arms, stomach, and legs from self-harm. And uh, yeah, I, I definitely have needed rescuing by God. I definitely have been in bondage, and um, at some point, each of these things have controlled my life. Um, I didn't reach out to God, and sometimes I did. And God at that point said, no, I need you to go through this, to become who I need you to be. Um, not all of the, I wasn't born with all of these things. A lot of these disorders were really developed out of trauma. Um, and because of the coping mechanisms I used as a kid, really uh, perpetuated the problems that I had as an adult. Now this is a rhetorical question, so don't raise your hand or anything. But how many people have struggled with some of the things that I've mentioned? Depression, anxiety, PTSD, bipolar, alcohol, drugs, eating disorder, self-harm, suicidal ideations, or maybe even suicide attempts. Unfortunately, these things have become more common. Um, and the age that people start these are younger and younger. I spoke with a friend yesterday who works at Riverbend, and she had to uh, watch a child, an eight-year-old boy, who was on suicide watch. My first suicide letter was in fourth grade. Um, I went to see my psychiatrist a couple weeks ago for med management. And then I've been seeing her for about 12 years. And she was encouraging me because she had just seen a lot of growth and really didn't feel like I was the same person and that for things that have happened in my life, it was pretty high functioning, so she thought. But um, she said, you know, 12 years ago, I thought you would last a month and then I wouldn't see you again, that I thought you would be dead. And um, it shocked me. I think because when you're in the midst of this stuff, you don't realize where you are. You don't realize how deep you're in the muck and mire that you are. I'd like to share a little bit now about my background because I feel like it's relevant to the mental illnesses that I have um, battled with. From the age of four, by four, I've been sexually abused or raped by four different people. By my teens, it grew to six. Being kidnapped by a bus driver took me off, and then by a Catholic priest, um, who was like my grandfather. My first memories, and mo most of the trauma happened at age four, but did continue through my life. I come from, uh, both my parents were severe alcoholics. My mom left when I was an infant, would come back, leave, come back, and finally, um, my father kicked her out at four, so my father raised me. Uh, I came, my father shot my mom in front of us at about age four. Very, on a weekly basis, severe violence. Um, this was normal for me. I really didn't know anything else. I was consistently abused by a family member who also did some pretty torturous things to me. Um, and what I did as a kid is I developed this shell where I would escape. I don't ever remember crying. Didn't cry when my mother left and woke up the next day and she wasn't there. Didn't cry when I was physically or sexually abused. I had disappeared. And those things that I developed as a child came over into my adult life that I was not vulnerable, that I didn't need anyone, that I didn't want to be weak, that I didn't want to need anyone. And those things had really hindered my relationship with people, my relationship with myself, my relationship definitely with God and family members. I didn't trust anyone. I couldn't trust anyone. Um, I don't remember my dad very much until about fourth grade. I spent every night in a cheesy bar in New Orleans uh, in a very bad area of town. I had my ninth birthday there. I thought it was the greatest thing since sliced 
pie because it's what I knew. Um, we were around a lot of inappropriate things for many years. And so I really didn't know what was normal. This was normal. Uh, didn't want to appear weak. I uh, then at about 10, my father remarried. It was actually, he didn't remarry. The barmaid came to live with us from the bar. And um, my dad was my life. Then I didn't really know my mom. My dad died when I was 15. And then my stepmother tried to commit suicide with me in the room. Everyone in my family, including my parents, tried to take their life, and one sibling succeeded. So this was always a back door. As a kid, I felt very dispensable. I remember spending nights at four years old in a house where no one came home. And I didn't cry, and I tried to act tough, but I didn't know where people were or why they wouldn't come home. And that's when, as the two other speakers spoke about, the shame and the unworthiness and feeling like I didn't matter and I was very dispensable started to take over my life. Um, when my father died, my world came crashing down. It was my life because he didn't leave me. So I overlooked all of the really bad things that happened with him because I felt like he didn't leave me. Um, when I moved, I moved away and I moved to live with a brother who was extremely abusive. He was 18 years older than me. Um, I finally said, I can't handle this, fa this family anymore. So I got an apartment. Well, I can't say it's an apartment. It was a cinder block old meat house that had been converted into an efficiency apartment. And at 16, I decided to live on my own, that it was the easiest thing and the best thing for me. So I did. I didn't tell the high school because they would have put me in foster care. So I lived on my own, worked many jobs, and I did it. I was able to graduate and did pretty well. Then I became a Christian in college, and uh, my life started changing. I really didn't see any signs of mental illness because I was a bulldozer. I was a type A person. I was an overachiever. So I didn't want to think about anything. So I kept myself busy and, and I, it worked. It was a skill that, a coping skill that worked for a while. But all of us know that you can only push things down for so long and then they're gonna bubble up. So I moved from Baton Rouge to Berkeley, California. <laughs> And uh, yeah, quite a difference. And um, my life was pretty successful. Worked at a venture capital investment firm, enjoyed life. And then I started seeing signs. In retrospect, I can see that I was on a manic for about two years, I think. I literally would get about two hours sleep and wouldn't stop. And I did this for a couple of years. And then I crashed, crashed and I burned. And I hadn't been in therapy yet. I had not dealt with anything. And I started seeing signs. So um, after I got married uh, was when, after I had my oldest daughter, Kelsey, um, postpartum blew my bipolar, just reared its ugly head. And from then I started having hospitalizations. I tried to take my life. And what I saw was that I could not be in control. And I have tried to control my life all, all my life. And I wanted to share um, a scripture in 2 Corinthians 12, 9. I can find it on my paper. It says, and there were many times I begged God to take this from me. I was ashamed. I never wanted to tell people I was bipolar. The stigma that it has in our society is I mean, if you've ever experienced depression or any of those things, you know 
And what's so crazy is that so many people have it, and yet we're so ashamed of it. Um, it says, so to keep me from becoming proud, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger from Satan to torment me and keep me from becoming proud. Three times I begged the Lord to take it away, and each time he said, my grace is all sufficient for you. My power works best in weakness. So now I am glad to boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ can work through me. I really do believe um, these things are not punishments from God. I don't think he caused these things. And I want to make it clear that even the things in my life, I really believe that um, people make choices and God has given us all the gift of free will. And unfortunately, people's free will, we will bear the brunt of their sin, of their horrible atrocities on us. On uh, We fall prey to that. And God aches. His heart aches when that happens. But unfortunately, we have the choice. He's not going to make us do what's right. And so, um, you know, I've heard a, a loving God wouldn't let this happen. Well, people make it happen. Um, the survival skills that I've developed and the coping skills as a kid, they don't work for me anymore. They worked, they protected me, they kept me sane, actually. And I wasn't overwhelmed. I don't think I could have handled the emotions that came with a lot of the trauma had I not just disappeared and shut down. But today as a Christian, as a mother, as a friend, as a woman, that doesn't work for me. And that is how I developed the cutting, the alcohol, the, you know, the mental illnesses, really because of the coping skills, I think, that I used instead of going to God. And, and I'm going to tell you, I believe in medication. I think that it's given a lot too freely, but I will be suicidal without my medication. I believe in therapists. I believe in doctors. I think God is the divine healer, and we have got to go to God first. But there, there are serious illnesses that we need professional help with. Um, one last, another scripture is in 2 Corinthians 1.8. It says, we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about the trials we experienced in the province of Asia. We were under great pressure, far beyond our ability to endure, so that we despaired even life itself. Indeed, we had received the sentence of death, but this happened that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God, who raises the dead. He has rescued us from such a deadly peril, and he will rescue us again. Um, I need rescuing every day. Um, I've done pretty well, but I definitely um, go two steps forward, two steps backwards, and I probably will for the rest of my life. At this point, God has chosen to say to me, my grace is sufficient for you. He's chosen not to completely heal me of the bipolar, and I really believe it's probably what's going to help me get to heaven because it keeps me on my face, it keeps me on my knees, it makes me desperate and humble, it makes me need God because I can't do it on my own. I think the other thing, um, well, let me share this first. In Romans 8.28, it says, And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. I believe God works good in everything, in sin and tragedy and horrific things. Something good can come out of it. And I really believe that through the things in my life, it's not a woe is me. It's not, you know, God has made good come out of it. It has helped me to have compassion, to feel, to have empathy, to have a heart that I didn't as a kid, and that it broke me in a good way to reach up to God. Um, I think along with that is we need people. We definitely need God, and he's the number one. I had no one to help navigate, help me navigate through life as a kid. Um, my emotions... Um, I was all alone, and I had no one. And so, you know, as a child, we tell ourselves things, and they're usually wrong. 
and then we have to undo them as an adult and relearn and rewire our brain. But there are a lot of you even in this room today that have been so instrumental in helping me navigate my life, my emotions, my decisions. Um, I had decided I would be a broken person for the rest of my life. I had accepted that this was my lot. And that I was weird. And that I, you know, definitely had these, I mean, look at the list, good grief. You know, who wouldn't think they're a little cray cray? And it was overwhelming to me. But there have been people I prayed specifically that God would lead me to the right therapist, that she would be spiritual, that she would love God, that she would use the scriptures, and he did. And there were things that I never thought that I could change or that God would change in my life, um, and, and he has. I don't feel like a broken child anymore. And we suffer in silence. I know there are a lot of you that probably feel that way. But I want to let you know that God wants to rescue you. He has rescued me, but he will continue. And it's going to be an ongoing process. I have had um, the privilege of having people love me when I was unlovable, cry with me, um, hurt with me. And if these things have happened in my life so that I can go out and share what God has done with me and maybe through my words or just hugging someone and not saying anything and just being an empty vessel for Christ, if, if this is what these things have done in my life to help someone else, then it's worth it. This is what I believe God had to, in a loving way, do, allow not necessarily do, but allow in my life. I think it grieved him, and those of you who have gone through trauma, and all of us have to some degree, and I don't in any way want to minimize other people's trauma, uh, you don't have to have a list to feel pain. It, pain is pain, and God wants to rescue that. Don't suffer in silence. I think it's important to go to him, but it's also important to have someone in your life that can help you navigate through this. And if you've had suicidal ideations, take that seriously. Talk to someone today. Talk to anyone. Talk to me, talk to, but take it seriously. I lost one brother to that, and my family didn't take it seriously because he said it a lot. And then it happened, and it's a permanent problem to a temporary, it's a permanent solution to a temporary problem. There's nothing that God cannot rescue you from. There's nothing that is so horrible in our lives that we can't get up with the help of God's grace and with other people. So I hope these things have maybe touched you in some way. Um, again, if there's Anything that you can relate to and need to talk to one of the persons here, um, please feel free to do that. And let God rescue you, you know, and know that he's done it when you haven't even known. And go to God desperately. It's okay. You don't have to feel shame. I still battle with the stigma of mental illness. Um, it doesn't help, the media doesn't help, you know, serial killers, and they'll just throw, okay, they're bipolar, you know, or some teacher, you know, decides to have sex with a student, oh, she was bipolar, you know, and they give us real bipolar people a bad name, because it's just so easily stuck on people. So I've had to learn that the stigma, it's not about me. I didn't do anything, it's not like I did something to get this. But it is it's, it's very humbling, to be honest, and I need to be humbled because then I look up to God. Thank you.
Oh.